Lucy, are you are you ready? Look, she's very you're looking very cute these days. And the and the Willie cam is on, so I can see look at you, Nintendo. Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. I'm going to start today with uh, TEFI data, the Texas Epidemic Public Health uh, Institute, because it is the beginning of respiratory virus season. And everything is going up. Adenovirus, parainfluenza virus, RSV for those people who need or need to get an RSV vaccine, those over 60 years of age, all you need is one. Enterovirus D68, which is also a respiratory virus. Interestingly enough, uh, Mpox is beginning to fall down. I <laughs> won't go into detail about that. Uh, norovirus, which is GI virus, is up. And uh, the only thing that's really interesting is that you know, influenza is not yet beginning to rise. So it's, it's the beginning of the influenza season soon. Uh, you should all be vaccinated against influenza. And SARS-CoV-2 is not very abundant right now. So that's the good news. But there are a lot of viruses around. A lot of people I know are getting colds. Uh, and, of course, what bugs me the most is that this vaccine hesitancy is spreading. Uh, and it spreads because of people saying goofy things, like the FDA <laughs> and CDC. Uh, Vinay Prasad, who's supposed to be in charge of vaccines for the FDA, had a, a memo that was leaked. The Washington Post got hold of it. And in that email, he says maybe 10 children deaths were because of the COVID vaccine. So you wonder why uh, people have vaccine hesitancy when you hear something like that. But they provide no detail of the cases. We don't know if there are risk factors, don't know even if that's true. It's just out there. And put it in perspective, there are nearly 1 billion COVID vaccines that were given to Americans, and at least 100 million were children and adolescents. Uh, and you know, you don't take a child's death uh, lightly, but if if it's 10 of 100 million, you know, it's a, it's a different view. So it's just, I think, kind of irresponsible, and it's unfortunate because this is what contributes to vaccine uh, hesitancy in people. So I thought it'd be good to look at the Pew Research Center's uh, survey data on vaccines. So this is, a, you know, interesting. A majority of Americans are confident that childhood vaccines are highly effective against serious illness. And if you look at it, um, uh, it's highly effective. Have they been tested enough, or is the vaccine schedule safe? Most people are pretty positive around. So 63 plus 21 somewhat, so 84% uh, are either somewhat or extremely supportive of the fact that they're highly effective. To me, that's a problem because if it's only 84%, we've talked about this before, in the case of measles, you need 95% of the population vaccinated to prevent outbreaks. And if only 85% are, are positive, I'm more worried about the you know 11% here that don't think they're effective, or the 20% who thinks that vaccines haven't been tested enough, or, or don't think that the children's vaccine schedule is safe. That's 20%. So that's the real problem. And if you're over the age of 65, <laughs> smart people over the age of 65, almost all of them, it's like 89, 90% believe that they're highly effective and that they've been tested and all that kind of stuff, that they're safe. But you look at the younger uh, age group, 18 to 29 and 30 to 49, there are 20 to 25 percent of people don't think they've been tested or aren't safe. And that's a problem because that's the age group that's having kids. So, you know, we've got a real significant problem with vaccine hesitancy in the age groups of people who are having children. Uh, this is a good example. 84 percent of Americans say the benefits of MMR vaccine outweigh the risks. Well. As I said before, that's true. Uh, it was 88% in 2016, it's dropped to 84%. But that's not enough. It needs to be 95% to prevent outbreaks. And so we're gonna continue to have outbreaks. Uh, of, and, and, and we're seeing it across the world. This isn't just an American phenomenon. This is worldwide. Uh, the vaccine hesitancy has become a real uh, problem. So let's talk about the best example of what happens with uh, vaccine hesitancy. So the WHO just published its data on, on measles. Uh, and so measles has been, the case, case number uh, has been growing, but deaths have been declining. There's still a lot, but they've been declining relative to the number of cases. So uh, global immunization efforts have uh, led to an 88% drop in measles deaths from 2000 to 2024. But there were still 95,000 people, mostly children younger than five, uh, age of five, who died in 2024. 
95,000 died from measles, and it's all preventable. This is, a, I mean, to me, that's really tragic. Um, and they estimated that probably 59 million lives have been saved be, for the people who have had the vaccine. So uh, it's a real problem uh, that continues. Now, if you look across the world, uh, Eastern Mediterranean region, um, they had a 47% increase um, uh, in 42 percent increase in Southeast Asia, Africa, 40 percent uh, cases. Decli there has been a, de a declining uh, in the percent that are uh, that are dying from it, but it's still a large increase in the number of of cases uh, because of worldwide vaccine hesitancy. So uh, the, the let's talk a little bit about the flu vaccine since it is important. This is the beginning of flu season. Uh, the way this works is in order to get pick out what uh, what influenza A and B varieties you're going to have in the vaccine, they have to do it pretty far in advance, usually in March of the previous year. And the reason is because most of the manufacturing still is in eggs, and eggs take a long time uh, to develop. So they are often, uh, you know, having to decide in March so that they have the, you know, they have the vaccines available in the fall. It takes that long to make them. Uh, the CDC is recommending seasonal flu vaccine for children, pregnant women, and adults with a single dose formulation. And there's some evidence that the high dose is um, uh, the best. It's a trivalent vaccine uh, to H1N1 and H3N2 virus and the B, Victoria B lineage. So it's a trivalent. I mentioned this last week, the N2 variety uh, that was in the Southern hemisphere sort of was slightly different. It's slightly different clade. It's a little bit different from the one that's in the vaccine. So there may be a little bit more of a mismatch. So we'll probably have more flu cases than we do we did last year. In 2024, uh, the FDA did approve flu mist, which is an attenuated influenza virus that you can uh, administer yourself. You just basically spray it in your nose. It, it, it replicates in, uh, in your nose because that's it cold enough there. And that's a very effective vaccine. And in 2025, they, uh, they approved flu block, which is a recombinant influenza. Uh, so that, that's a, a sort of new technologies, recombinant and then manufactured in, uh, in cells. Uh, there was a study that just showed that the high dose vaccine protects better against hospitalization than the standard dose. Uh, that was two large European trials, and that included people who were younger than 60. So uh, the high dose is definitely better. Now, this, you know, the vaccine makes a difference in, in preventing serious illness, but people still get it, and, it, and the, the seasonal flu vaccine varies on its effectiveness. If you look at back to 2009 and 10, up to 2024, you can see that sometimes it's 50 percent, 60 percent, other times 30 percent, and when 2014, 15, it was a mismatch, it was only 20 percent effective. So it varies between 20 and 60 percent effectiveness which is why we need to constantly be trying to find better vaccines. The trouble uh, with the, the old method of, of, of vaccine production through eggs is you have to put the virus in the eggs, the egg, it, it, it sort of the virus adapts to the eggs and you can take that virus out, I mean that uh, vaccine out uh, that's a virus adapted in eggs and injected into people and it's very good at binding the, the virus that is adapted in eggs. Unfortunately, it's less good at binding free floating virus. Whereas the recombinant ones that you grow in cell culture are much better at producing antibodies that actually stick to free floating virus, you know, and it's a lot of eggs. I mean, you got to you got to you got to do a lot of egg production, and it's slow. And, and so actually, we should be moving on to recombinant technologies, and the, and the mRNAs are, are really really promising. Uh, and there was a study in the New England Journal. Pfizer did a study on uh, mRNA vaccine. Now this, of course. Uh, they've stopped all the mRNA research, was, which is crazy. It was, again, was from Pfizer in the 2022-23 season, flu season. They did an mRNA vaccine to H3N2 and H1N1, and it was very, very effective. Uh, it was more effective, almost 60-67% uh, protective versus the 44 to 50% of the traditional uh, uh, type uh, vaccine. So that looked very promising. The only problem was it had a lot of side effects. So, you know, it, need, it's, it needed to be developed and the dose might have been uh, too high, but two-thirds of the people who got vaccinated had a real big response in their arms so it compared to about half who had the traditional vaccine. You know, that's a very common local uh, reaction, but the mRNA vaccine seemed to do more. And, and then they also had a, a higher number of people with the mRNA vaccine who got flu-like symptoms uh, after the vaccine. So that was in development, unfortunately, all that stopped. And we do need better vaccines that are not just egg-based. 
So uh, a little bit about bird flu. The Washington state official did confirm that that one patient who had H5N5 did pass away from that. That's a shame. That's the second uh, death. Um, and of course, H5N1 has finally made it to Texas. Galveston County Health District announced Monday that avian influenza had been detected in the county. They found 27 dead seabirds. Six were sent to UTMB for analysis, and it turns out they were H5N1. The 10 people who were exposed to these were tested, and they were, remained negative, so none of them seem to have come down with it, but eight of the 10 are actually taking Tamiflu. And the, <laughs> the health department reminded people, be careful of your pet cats, because cats can come down with Kind of come down with bird flu and die from bird flu. You don't want that to happen. Lily doesn't really care, but you know, you don't want that to happen. Keep just protect your cats. Uh, so we've had 71 cases uh, of bird flu in the United States. There have been two deaths now, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention today: there are two things on aging that I thought were interesting. First of all, there's a study from the Framingham Heart Study that showed that physical activity over an adult life course uh, has helps reduce your risk of dementia. And it was so, it was like a 40% reduction if you had significant physical activity late in life. Not early in life, but middle, middle age and then late in life. And there was a really interesting study that showed in geriatric oncology that as you age, uh, this is shown in the blue line here, that uh, cancer risk seems to flatten out. So you, you're more likely to have dementia than cancer risk, which is interesting. And, the, and they postulated it's possible that because you're aging, your cells are aging too, and they don't like to replicate as much as they, as they do when you're younger. Anyway, it was an interesting study that showed that uh, cancer risk seems to be plateau when you get to a certain age, over the age of 70 or so. Okay, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to all the seventh graders uh, at the Baylor College of Medicine Biotech Academy at Rusk Middle School who were presented with their blue coats at the ceremony uh, in November. So the blue coats represent the students' interest in pursuing careers in health professions. And a special shout out to all the family members and teachers who support these young folks uh, and these students on our, are hopefully on a path to becoming leaders in biotechnology. Uh, very much involved with our institution, I'm really excited about them. Congratulations to our researchers at the Dan L. Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center, recently awarded more than $15 million in grants by the CPRID of Texas uh, to support innovative research and treatment uh, and, and prevention of cancer. And finally, a big shout out and thank you to Dr. Jim Poole, who we honored this week for his almost 50 years of service to patients. He's been a, uh, had the vision many years ago to really create a comprehensive healthcare clinic. Uh, his legacy in that clinic will continue as we expand, not only here, but in the Woodlands and eventually to the Memorial. So congratulations on his retirement and um, we've missed Dr. Poole. Anyway, have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.